I want to go ahead and begin today. I feel uh, uh, good. I've got more more people in my audience than John Stewart has, so so I guess I'm doing good. So hello to Facebook folks. So Jackie is out there, and Amelia, and uh, the Farrells are out there. A number of families are out on Facebook today, and so that's uh, good for us to worship together with them. So it's hard to know what uh, uh, attitude to take, right? It's been a very confusing week. It's been very uh, unsettling. Uh, it took me a couple days to kind of get oriented to the new normal, right? And uh, it's a little confusing what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Uh, even as late as last night, I was still debating whether we should meet or not meet or just meet on Facebook. And uh, But... Uh, somebody said to me, just use your brain, right? <laughs> just use your brain, be smart, uh, take your precautions, wash your hands, and, uh, and uh, pray together. But uh, we're people who, uh, in the midst of confusion, find a sense of stability. That's part of what it means for us to be people of faith, and we're going to talk about that together today. Um, and so I'm going to begin the way I always begin our service with a, um, a statement that it's good for us to be together, whether we're together physically, whether we're together on Facebook, it's good for us to gather because God always means for us never to be alone. And so uh, we are grateful for technology that even if we are isolated physically, we don't have to be isolated uh, from others through phone calls, through uh, Zoom. And uh, we're having every night at 8 o'clock, 8.30, we're having evening devotions uh, together with people here in the church. And so you're welcome to uh, call the church office and find out how to get on that. But um, we go back to the book of Lamentations where the uh, prophet Jeremiah, the prophets were the people who spoke for God to the people of God. And in the middle of a time when uh, the city had been destroyed and the nation had been defeated by a foreign army and people were being uh, carried off into exile in other lands, Jeremiah says this, this is what I will say to my soul and so recover hope. And so that recovering of hope, getting our, getting our souls back in line, this is what I will say to my soul and so recover hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of our God. And so God gives us one day after the next, and uh, we have a look at history. You see that God carries us through many things, and uh, we believe that God will continue to carry us through many things until the day when all things are put right, when uh, Christ returns, and when there is no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more suffering. And so we look for that day through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's good for us to be together. So a couple of announcements uh, for you. We will be uh, meeting a Bible study tomorrow night. We're planning on meeting Bible study. We're in the book of Acts, and we're going to be studying uh, Philip, uh, meeting the Ethiopian uh, in Acts chapter 8. So if you want to prepare for that, you're welcome to do that. But again, we are doing evening devotions uh, at 8.30 on Zoom, and that's been a good time for us to just get together for 10, 15 minutes, pray together, read some scripture, talk, and then uh, pray again and let everyone go about their business. But we touch base uh, with each other. So today we will not be passing the offering plates, and we won't be greeting in the normal way. We'll wave to each other in a minute, but uh, we won't be greeting each other. You're already distributing yourselves around the sanctuary here, so that's good, you know, keep some distance. We do have our coffee hour, and we only have food that was commercially prepared, and uh, we have a number of uh, sandwiches as well from the Rutgers um, uh, food service. I was at a meeting yesterday at New Brunswick Seminary where there were supposed to be 90 people, and so all 20 of us got there, and uh, it was a great meeting, but there was piles of food, so we've got the food from the Rutgers uh, thing. If you'd like to take some, you're welcome to that. And so uh, next Sunday afternoon, we're still planning to have our new member class, so if you're interested in membership, we encourage you to come out next uh, Sunday at 2 o'clock 
and we'll be together there. So let's take a moment and uh, uh, wave to each other. If anyone wants to come up here and wave to Facebook people, come up here and wave to the Facebook people, that'd be great. We're all waving to each other. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> waving to Facebook people. All right, that was an adequate greeting for today. All right, let's take a minute to pray, and then uh, I'm going to have praise band come. Uh, they'll come right away and uh, present the music that they sing. So let's pray together. God of the ages, we come before you in a time that for us feels very disturbing. We don't know what's going to happen in the days and weeks ahead. We are taking precautions. We do pray today for all those who are sick and uh, for all those who are in authority as they try to make decisions about closing schools and stores and universities, that you would give to them wisdom and insight. We do pray for health and recovery uh, for all and for uh, the ability for this not to spread widely and cause great harm. In the midst of all of this, we remember the words of the prophet Jeremiah, who took charge of his soul in a time when it seemed like his world was collapsing and said, this is what I will say to my soul. And so, Lord, teach us to speak to our souls today, to say to our souls, uh, soul, recover hope. The steadfast love of God never fails. God's purposes will unfold, and God will provide for us what we need each day. And so as we worship today, give us the grace to be at peace and give us the grace to be wise. For we pray it together in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm going to invite Praise Band to come, and they've prepared some encouraging words for us, and we're very grateful for that. Good morning, everyone that's here and on Facebook. Hello. Um, we have songs today that um, should hopefully reflect the message that's being shared today. We know our second song definitely comes straight from the scripture. Um, but we're going to start with Your Love, O Lord. So you can stand and join with us as we sing.
Be seated. Very grateful for Praise Band again, and I don't know how musicians do this, but they change the tenor or the feel of the song, and it feels very calm song today, more acoustic and more um, calm for us, less driving and stirring us up, but more calming us. And I think that's what we need right now. 
right? We need, does anybody know friends who are like panicking crazy? Right, yeah. And uh, so we need to find ways to uh, get our thinking in gear and our feelings a little less crazed. I was at this meeting yesterday at the seminary all day, and it was, it was about anxiety. It, it had been planned for months and months. But it was about, uh, in the middle of all kinds of turmoil, how your feelings can get out of control and they can get you into a place where you're reacting and not uh, thinking very clearly. Your feelings go up, your thinking goes down. And so how do you get a grip on your feelings to come to a place where you can think clearly and uh, find the right things to do? We want to be wise. But we also want to act out of a place of centeredness and calmness. And so uh, Praise Band helped us to do that today. Uh, Jeremiah helps us to do that when he says, this is what I will say to my soul, and so recover hope. That we have to remember that God is faithful, God has been faithful. And uh, as I put in the prayer of confession today, Jesus is quite used to being in out-of-the-box places, out-of-normal places. And uh, Jesus does good things in those places. We'll see that today in John chapter 4. And uh, we see that in the account of the resurrection that we're headed to as we're in this Lenten season. We're only a few weeks away from Easter now. And uh, we'll remember that at a time when things looked the darkest, at a time when people felt the most hopeless, in the middle of that time, God brought life, God brought light, Jesus is risen. Uh, and so there is good news. And so this is what we do as Christians. We believe that in the midst of whatever it is we face, that God can bring something good, that God can give us a future, and God can give us a hope. And so we'll think about that today. So our passage of scripture today, again, was chosen a long time ago, um, is John chapter 4, where Jesus talks with a woman at the well. And so Praise Band is entirely right. That second song is right out of the passage where Jesus meets a woman at this well and they have a conversation. And we'll talk about why this is kind of an out-of-the-box experience for uh, Jesus, for this woman, and for the disciples as well. It's not something that would have just naturally happened unless Jesus had done something out of the ordinary. And so uh, we'll think about that together today. We're certainly in a time of out of the ordinary. So this is John chapter 4. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. So the, John has begun his baptism. He had a lot of disciples and Jesus comes along. And now Jesus is becoming more popular. So he's now in the um, radar of the Pharisees, baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So things are getting a little uh, stirred up in Judea. So Jesus decides it's time to leave there and go back to the north country. So Judea is kind of the New York City kind of situation. And uh, Galilee is kind of Manahawkin, right? It's kind of a little bit away there and not quite as busy. So Jesus is going to leave Judea and go to Galilee. And he has to decide how he's going to get there, how he's going to travel. And so in verse uh, 4, it says, Now he had to go through Samaria. And so uh, if, you, if you were to look at maps, you see that Galilee is up here in the north, uh, Judea is down here in the south, and in between is Samaria. And, and so the scripture says he had to go through Samaria. But we'll talk about this, that he really didn't have to, that most people took the parkway. <laughs> they, they took the Jordan River Valley instead of going through Route 9, if you will. Uh, they, they took the fast road and, and avoided Samaria, which was full of undesirable people in Jesus' time. These were people who were despised, and we'll talk about that. But it's interesting that the gospel says Jesus had to go through there. And he didn't have to go because of uh, travel. He had to go because of what God wanted him to do. So he had to go through the uncomfortable place where he was going to do something unusual. So it's kind of interesting for us right now. We're, we're kind of going through this unusual time. 
And uh, Jesus is quite comfortable in unusual places, unusual times. So he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob has given, had given his son Joseph. And so again, here's history. There, uh, there's a reflection of hundreds and hundreds of years of history show up in this moment. And uh, so you can, uh, th th there are times when having a big view of history is very good because you can see that there have been moments of confusion and moments of difficulty and there's been a way through them and that they pass. And so there's a lot of history here that Jacob had given his son Joseph hundreds of years ago. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And this is a very out of the box moment because first of all, he's talking to a Samaritan, he's talking to a woman, and, and it's the middle of the day, and so a lot of uh, things are out of the box here. And Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Right, we have boxes. You're in this box, I'm in this box. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And so we, we did this last week where we talked about Jesus' unusual statements, where Jesus says all these kinds of things like cut off your hand and pluck out your eye and I'm the bread of life, I'm the water of life, I'm living water. And so he wants people to think about these things. So Jesus says to her, uh, if you knew who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman, like Nicodemus last week in the chapter before this, said, sir, I don't get it. I am thinking literally, you don't have anything to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And while I'm at it, I'm going to impress you with uh, who the Samaritans are instead of you. And are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? So she's trying to reinforce the box again, like, you don't forget, you're one of them and I'm one of these. And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water will be, I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. So wells are stagnant water. Springs are living, bubbling water, cool, refreshing water. He says, uh, you don't need well water. You need spring water. The water that I give will become a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, Go, call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said, You are right when you say you have no husband. Fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And so Jesus begins to move into uh, her life a bit and talk about uh, what her uh, experience has been. And uh, she says to him in verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. So let, you can understand things from God. So let me, let's get off me and onto something else, she says. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I don't want to talk about my life and what's happening to me. Let's talk about religious questions. And uh, so we'll talk about where you should worship. 
And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So he says, it's not, you want, you want to have an argument about your box is over here at this mountain and your box is here and you worship in this way and we worship in that way. He says, this, this is not the point. He says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. We'll worship in spirit and truth. For these are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman outside of the box. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? They're used to Jesus doing unusual things. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Jesus is talking, he's been spiritually fed by ministering to other people. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? So you got your boxes about when things should happen. But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest now. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I have sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. All those hundreds of years before all the work that the prophets have done and you're reaping the labor of it. And many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He, did me, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days out of the box. You're not supposed to stay in the home of a Samaritan. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. And so Jesus chooses to do things a little bit different, a little out of the box, a little unusual, to get out of the, the sequences that everyone's laid out, to get out of the little associations that everybody has, and wonderful things happen. And so we'll think about that in our message together today. So I'm gonna talk to our children for a minute, children's message, and uh, I think if we have Amelia out there and Peyton and Dallas are out there too, and so we'll say hello to them. I'll do the children's message for them here. That's okay. So, um, so what is this? I'll ask the children, what is this stuff? What is this? What is that? You may have seen this around lately, right? This is the hand sanitizer. And so everything's kind of disrupted right now, right? Everything is kind of confusing. And uh, so what's happening in your schools, right? And so some of you are not going to school. You're going to have to study at home. You're going to have to do things. And it gets very confusing, right? And so uh, when you've been in school, I bet you go to school and you learn things you never knew before. Isn't that right? What's something new you never learned before? And so maybe you learned something new in school this week. And, uh, and so when you go to school, you're not worried about having to learn new things because you have a teacher with you. And so the teacher is there. And even though you don't know all the things you need to know, 
you know the teacher will be there and lead you and guide you through it. And that's kind of what we believe as Christians right now. That even as we're going through this time where we're not sure exactly what to do and we're trying to learn the lessons and we're trying to do it, we believe that God is with us in it. And so just like you go to school and you're not worried about your learning because a teacher will help you, we believe that God is our present help. And so the scriptures say God is our refuge and strength, very present help in time of trouble. So let's take a moment and pray for all your school friends and uh, all these weeks that you'll be uh, home in a little different time, but God will be with us through it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, our children, and we thank you for the teachers that they have. Lord, we do pray for all of the schools that are in disruption right now, and we're so grateful for people who help us to learn what we don't know. Lord, we are all kind of students now. We're all learning new things. We're all experiencing things that are unfamiliar to us. And so we pray that you'll help us to find our way through it, but to believe that we're not alone. And there will be teachers and there will be the information and that you will be with us always, just as you were with the disciples in all the times when they had to learn new things. And so help us to believe that, to trust you, and to listen each day for what you would have us to learn. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I think I'll use this here. Here we go. Okay. Good example for us. <laughs> okay. So let's come to our time of prayer together. So let's certainly pray for the world, right? And so there's some places are really... So I understand China is starting to calm down a little bit. Okay. China is moving again, so it passed through there. China's, uh, Italy is kind of in a difficult time right now. And uh, so, but, and then we're kind of heading into it. Spain and France, too. So let's pray for uh, people around the world. But again, let's pray for people to not get um, overwhelmed by the change, uh, but to believe that we can find our way and God will be with us through this. Um, other requests we need to remember today? <laughs> Restaurants and, and ShopRite. Shoprite. Yeah. yeah, and the medical people, doctors and nurses as well. Yeah. There's some people being nasty to people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I pray for our ambulance folks. Uh, we have some with us uh, who work ambulance and teachers as they try to find their way through this moment as well. So. I saw a thing on Facebook earlier this week um, out of France just before they did shut down. They, I don't remember what town it was, but they had an event and they had hundreds of people come out and it was just a fun day and the, the person running it said, it was the president of France said, we can't be afraid to not to stop living our lives. We can't stop. Yeah, we can't. We have to have fun. Like that. Have to have some fun. Yeah, they were all dressed up like Smurfs. Uh, that was right. Smurfs. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. So they sang to each other from the, the balconies, yeah. Yeah, we, you know, it's always this balance, right, of wisdom and faith, right? We, we're not people who jump off like we did with the uh, Jesus temptations. We don't jump off towers and expect God to catch us. We don't do stupid things and expect God to bail us out. We are wise, uh, but still we... Um, in the midst of things, we have to trust God. So both, that both things. Yeah, Rich Massal goes down in Florida, and uh, he's recovering from his uh, hand injury and from that accident. Let's pray for him. My mom's father's going to be moving up here from Florida. Okay, so mom's uh, father's moving up, and Trudy is uh, home now. She was in the hospital, so our prayers. Okay, Jeff's foot yeah, on the mend. Yeah, I heard his foot.
and walking in stores, seeing people that worship here, and to be able to just come alongside is a gift. Yeah, it's a gift. I pray for even recovery. There's people and this church tremendously still keeping their doors open. There's a lot of groups that are struggling right now for hope and um, help. And I, I, I really, I ran into someone that I used to go to my old church with, and they were. They were besides themselves, and I said, I'm just praying. Mm -hmm. Continuing prayer. Yeah. Much yeah. Pray for the other people who are, churches are shut down, and they feel isolated, and um, people in recovery movements who need to gather to encourage each other. Okay, John, and praise Van. Yeah. Doug is down in Florida, yeah where the temperature is over the temperature to kill the virus. So good, good, for that. <laughs> good for them. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you because you are the living water. You are the source of a spring within us that can spring up and satisfy our thirst. You are able to bring us peace in the midst of confusion you are able to bring us comfort in the midst of distress. You are able to remind us in times when it seems like the world is coming apart, that the world is not coming apart, that you will bring a new heavens and a new earth, that you will bring a day, and you have brought your church and you brought the world through many things to this very day. And so, God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, we pray today for our world. We pray for healing grace. We pray for wisdom for all to take wise precautions in what they do. Lord, we pray for people who have trouble making those precautions. Refugees, especially, who find themselves in camps, displaced from home, not having adequate running water, Lord, we ask a special grace for them, that you would keep them from this. Lord, we pray for all the doctors and nurses around the world who tend to people who are sick. We pray for all the service folk in supermarkets and in stores and all the essential people in ambulance who work. We ask you to give them wisdom and to keep them safe as well. Lord, we pray together for people who are panicking whose view of the world seems to encompass the last 10 minutes of the news instead of centuries and thousands of years. Lord, we pray that we as people who come from a tradition that goes from the creation of the world to its recreation will be people who have the stability that that brings and will be able to share that with others. Lord, we pray today uh, as well for our nation. We pray for all of our officials. We pray for those who are trying to make decisions, for school administrators, for um, government officials who try to decide what to say. Lord, we pray for all the students who will be displaced in this, these coming weeks and for teachers who will try to do their best for them and for folks in recovery movement who find their recovery disrupted by this. Lord, we ask your grace for them and for our community here. Lord, help us when we encounter people who are, are angry and people who are uh, beside themselves to be a source of faith, to be a source of hope, to be a source of love. For these are your gifts to us. And so, Lord, we take a moment quietly to lift you the prayers that we carry on our hearts. Lord, for all of the ways you give us to meet, for technology, for Facebook, for Zoom, for uh, our website, for all the ways in which we're able to uh, reach out and be together, even if we're not physically together, we thank you for these things and pray that uh, we would help others to learn to use these tools uh, for good as uh, we go through this time together. 
Lord, we are committed to being disciples. And as the disciples followed you and as they saw you do unusual things, and yet they just stayed with you. So, Lord, help us just to stay close to you even when we don't understand what's happening, what you're doing, but to know that your love is upon us and that you intend good for us. And so, Lord, help us to believe that as disciples, even as we remember the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Those of you who are on Facebook uh, may note that in a post I made, I put a early draft of this message up, and so uh, you're welcome to see it there as well. <laughs> Thank you for that encouraging word. <laughs> and so here we are. So here we are at the third week of the Lenten season. We began, it was slightly different circumstances a couple of weeks ago. We're in the midst of this. And we expect that by Easter, things will have subsided a bit. But we're in the third Sunday of Lent, third week of the Lenten season. And for hundreds of years, Christians have gathered during these weeks. We are part of a tradition that spans hundreds and even thousands of years as we are here today. These weeks leading to Good Friday and Easter. And if you think about that, the church gathering all of those years, they have gathered in many different situations. They have gathered in times of persecution, when gathering or having scriptures could mean jail or even the end of your life. Christians faced that kind of a circumstance, and they persevered, and people tried to find their way through it, and the church came through those times. Christians gathered during all kinds of different times. Christians gathered during the times of the Black Plague in Europe. You remember reading about that in history class, right? Back in 1347 in Europe, when uh, and for five years they went through this. Our ancestor Christians worshiped all through this time. The five years, the Black Death, the Black Plague, would kill more than 20 million people in Europe. Church has been through times like these, and even worse times than these. 20 million people in Europe, which was almost a third of Europe's population at the time. So one out of every three people. And the church lived through that, and the church continued to worship, and the church continued to gather and uh, to announce good news in Christ. The church gathered during World War I as mustard gas rolled over the trenches, 22 million people died in World War I. And the church continued to meet, the church continued to believe, the church continued to hope. And they gathered during World War II, they gathered during the Vietnam War, they gathered in the financial problems of 2008. How many of you remember 2008? Right? And the markets, right? Remember the markets? And then, and then the church still gathered, the church still gathered. Church gathered in recovery from Hurricane Sandy. You remember Hurricane Sandy? And we lived through that. We found our way through it. Christians gather in all kinds of circumstances. When markets are good, when markets are bad, when people are healthy, when people are sick, when the world is at peace, when the world is at war, Christians continue to gather and pray and seek the comfort and wisdom that come from God to us. And the reason is that we have a God who is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in time of trouble. We read this psalm this past week during evening prayers on Zoom on Thursday evening as we gathered uh, there to just kind of stabilize our souls. As Jeremiah says, this is what I will say to my soul. What do we need to say to our souls right now? What do you need to say to your soul so that you can come to a place of faith, 
of hope and of love. And Psalm 46 is a great way to do that. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And so we were reminded that to be a Christian doesn't mean you avoid all times of trouble. We live in this broken world together with all other people who live in this broken world. And that we'll experience times of trouble just like everyone will experience times of trouble. But in that, here's the difference. God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. And so the psalm goes on to describe a scene where the mountains are, there's earthquakes and the mountains are falling and the ocean, the waves are coming up and swallowing the mountains and everything is in turmoil and the world is falling apart. And it says, God is our refuge and strength in the midst of that. And it says, there's still a place of calmness where God dwells. And it ends with these words, be still. When, when everything is crazy, when everything is in turmoil, be still and know that I am God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. We have to do with a God who is with us in times when it feels like things are falling apart, when times are not peaceful, when times are not normal. In fact, God seems to call us out of what seem to be normal times, to walk in times of challenge. And so Isaiah 43 is one of the passages that is um, a great passage that I've used many, many times, and I encourage you to find it uh, maybe for yourself during this season of uh, trouble that we're going through. In Isaiah 43, God reassures people when the world seems to be falling apart that he will be with them. And so we have this, these passages where he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. He says, I know you by name, you are mine, you are precious to me. These are the words of God through the prophet Isaiah to the people of God in a time of challenge. And you know, it's very interesting that uh, both Jewish, Christian, and Muslim uh, faiths all trace back to Abram, who is regarded as one of the great people of faith in the scriptures. And if you remember the Old Testament story, Abram lives in one of the most developed civilizations of the time. He lives between the rivers in Mesopotamia. And, and so he's got all the benefits that are available at that time of knowledge, of, of they, they had sanitation and they had water pathways and aqueducts and all of this urban cities. And, and God says to him, Abram, Leave this place and go to the place I will show you. God calls Abram out of this comfortable box that he's in and says, I need you to leave this because I want to bless the world through you. And so we read in Hebrews that this, by faith Abraham, being called by God, obeyed to go out unto a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, and this is the greatest part of this, right? This is, he went out not knowing where he was going. Isn't that beautiful? Right? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? So, so God says to Abram, I'm going to lead you somewhere, but, but you're not going to understand everything about it. You're not going to know how you're going to do it. You're not going to have all the answers you want. But go with me into this, and I will bless the world through you. Abram went out not knowing where he was going. Do you know where we're going in the next couple of weeks? I don't know where we're going in the next couple of weeks. It's crazy, right? You don't know. Every day you wake up, there's new news, there's this, there's that. We don't know where we're going, but we know who we go with. God says, Abram, go, I will go with you. And so uh, Oswald Chambers, one of the great writers of Christian faith in some past years, said this. He says, faith never knows where it is being led. 
faith, that's what faith is. Faith is not knowing, but still trusting. Faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. That's what faith is. Stepping into the unknown with God, stepping out of our boxes into unfamiliar territory, trusting that God knows where we're going, how to get there. It reminds me so much of Jesus talking to Philip in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to the disciples about heaven. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. My father's house are many mansions. And, and I'll go to prepare a place for you. And, and Philip says, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How can we know how to get there? We, we don't know the way. How do we tell us how to get there? And Jesus said, I am the way. And so it's as if Jesus says, you don't need a map for the future. You don't need to know all the ways to do it. You just need to know me and go with me. I am the way. If you stay with me, you'll get there. And so this is the call to us in this season of faith, a life of following Jesus out of the box into the unknown. The calling of Christians is not to expect a normal, predictable, in-the-box kind of life. It's to be out on the waters with Jesus. And so there's that great chorus, Oceans, right? We sing this chorus, Oceans, very often, you know. And, and one of the frames is in that great chorus that we sing is, You called me out upon the water, the great unknown where feet may fail. So, so my normal ways of dealing with things are not adequate for this. I'm in the unknown. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. That's really what Psalm 46 says. The oceans are turmoil, the mountains are falling, but there is a city where God dwells. And that changes the way we can live in the turmoil. It gives us the stability, the faith, the hope, the love, that we need as we walk together with God into this unknown. And so Jesus did this with the disciples in our passage today. Jesus leads the disciples into unfamiliar territory. It says they had to go through Samaria. And they didn't have to go through Samaria. Every other time they went, they went around Samaria, just like everybody else did. You don't go through Samaria if you don't have to. But it says Jesus had to go through Samaria, he leads them into unfamiliar territory. Are, are you willing to be led by God into unfamiliar territory? Is, is it okay if God takes you somewhere you've never been before, you don't know what to do, you have no idea how you're going to get through it? That seems to be what Jesus does. He had to go through Samaria. And so it's kind of like taking the parkway instead of Route 9. He goes the local route and he meets the people. Jesus took the less traveled road through the land of half-breed, unorthodox dog people. So that's the way the people, Jesus' people, looked at the Samaritans. They, they had intermarried with foreigners over the centuries as armies had come through, they were half-breeds. They had their own scriptures. They had changed the book of Moses. They had their own temple on another mountain. They, they were just out of the box. We don't want to bother with them. And Jesus jumps out of the box. He says, we got to go there. And he starts talking to the woman at the well. And so Jesus gets out of the normal routine, and that's where blessings start to happen. The rules that you are supposed to follow. Don't talk to those people. If, if you drink something, if they drink out of a, a, a cup, you can't drink out of that cup. In fact, if you get a hold of that cup, you have to smash it so nobody ever drinks out of it again. That was the box. That was the rule. And Jesus says to the woman, would you give me something to drink? And she goes, wait a minute, you don't, you don't know. You don't, wait, wait a minute, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, here's the rules. Here's how this goes. And Jesus said, no, we're, we're going to do something else here. I want you to be blessed. I want your whole city to be blessed. And so we're going to have to do things a little different here. 
And so Jesus goes to the well and talks to a woman. That's out of the box. Asks her for a drink of water. That's out of the box. And it's all very confusing for the disciples. They come back and they find that he's talking to the Samaritan woman. And, and it says nobody asked him what he was doing. They've been with Jesus long enough to expect the unexpected. They've been with Jesus long enough to know he doesn't fit in the boxes. They don't get it. But they're willing to go along with it. Because Jesus is out of the box talking to someone else because he has something good in mind to do. And he turns it into a life-transforming event for the whole village. They give up their own little box and they decide to go with Jesus and go with all the people who are going with Jesus. That's amazing. That's fantastic. But it's disorienting to the disciples and others. The disciples and others say, Jesus, why do you keep confusing us? We had them in a box. We knew who they were. They were the dogs. We were the good people. Why are you confusing us? And Jesus says, we need to bless others. Abram, you need to leave the comfort of that most developed civilization of the time because we need to go bless some other people. You need to get out of the comfort box. You need to talk to the other people. They're beloved of God, too. We need to bring good news to them. And so in Acts chapter 8, we're going to be studying on Monday night, Philip and the, and goes to Samaria, too, and he preaches the gospel there, people believe. And then an Ethiopian comes along. That's out of the box again. An Ethiopian comes along and Philip runs up to the chariot and talks to the Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian believes and goes, and we have a church then in Ethiopia. I have to start getting into unfamiliar territory with God. God does this to reach people, to bless people who are outside of the box. And so in this COVID time, uh, when all of our ordinary routines are disrupted, Right, I've been disoriented. I've been trying to figure out what, what's the next word, what's the next update that's going on. But in the midst of that, we say, Jesus, you're pretty familiar with dealing with unexpected and out-of-the-box stuff. We think we'll go through it with you. And you tell us that at root, this is about blessing others. At root, this is about finding a way to receive God's comfort and sharing it in the world with others that we travel with God, that God promises to be with us and provide for us. And in those times when the ordinary is, is gone, we learn some of the lessons of our faith. Jesus walking on the water as the disciples are in the storm. Abraham told to leave home. He learns about God by leaving his box. Going to the Samaritans with a new offer of new life and a new relationship with God and others, we learn that God loves them too. It's a time of learning, so I encourage you to use this as a time of learning. Time of learning about God, time of learning about yourself, time of learning about others. One of the things we learn is that God is interested in people that we are not interested in. That God is interested in people that we have written off, right? And that, that we are called to a global faith. We learn that God is interested in people that we have put in a box and pushed to the side and wish that they would go away. We learn that others have more to their lives than we think. You know, sometimes we think about them, those people, and we think we know them. And then all of a sudden you meet one and they have a very complex, rich life and they've had a life story and they have a history. And we learn that human beings in all of their complexity and confusion, like this woman with five husbands and all of this stuff, Jesus wants her to be blessed. Jesus wants her to have the living water. We know that we have a calling to connect with people of every kind in the world, to announce the good news in Jesus, and uh, to bring blessings to them. God is comfortable hovering over chaos and bringing order. God calls us to learn some things through this time. World Relief, we read their devotion, one of the evening prayers that we had on Zoom, and they, they said this, at times like this, the social distinctions that can separate us are stripped away, and we are all reminded we are all human. We are all in this together. 
whether in remote villages around the world, vulnerable refugees, immigrants in the US, we are all in this together. And so Jesus is amazing. Jesus is comfortable out of the box. He's comfortable seeing people who have complex lives, who are struggling with things, and saying, God is for you. I have living water for you. And that's for us. And Jesus is with us. And we, together with Jesus, are for others. And so let's learn through this time. Learn lessons of faith. And when we come through this and when we're out on the other side, we can look back and say, how did God help us to reach beyond ourselves? How did God use us to do things that were out of the ordinary, but still brought his blessing in the lives of others? We can do this because we've been called out of our boxes to walk with Jesus and bless others. And so may God give us the gifts of faith, of hope, and of love. Amen. We're going to invite Praise Van to come and close us. The last song we have to offer today is Enough. So please stand and join with us as we sing.
Let's pray together as we close. God of the ages, who has been with your people through all kinds of turmoil and confusion through the centuries, we ask for your presence now. Give us the long view of history. Give us the vision of faith to see what is beyond what we see, to see beyond this moment, to see the past, to see the future, to see your faithfulness, to see your promise. And Lord, as we deal with these things, give us the grace, if we need to, to reach out to others, to call them, to admit that we don't have what we need and we need to receive. Lord, for you are the one who says you will give us springs of living water that will well up inside us. And so, Lord, help us to discover those, give us those through your uh, spirit, through the life of other believers, through our fellowship, that we might find ways to live wisely and in faith, with faith, hope, and love in these days. And so, people of Jesus Christ, as you go from this place, may you go in peace. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you this day, and every day. Amen. Please join us for a coffee hour, but keep your distance and all that stuff. <laughs>